Okay, so today you're going to talk about transfer functions through Kramer's rule. And what that is, is simply a way to solve a system of differential equations. As you probably noticed in the last lecture when you're dealing with transfer functions, for complex systems, we'll deal with a set of differential equations in the frequency domain. And then somehow we have to combine them to create a explicit relation between one input and one variable of interest that describes certain characteristics of that system. Now that a problem, that, that a, a process may be a bit lengthy and a little mistake here and there will kind of ruin the entire solution. So there's got to be a better way to do that. And that's where uh, Kramer's rule comes in. It's a tool, it's a very simple tool that will help us solve a system of differential equations. Of course, we'll do that in the frequency domain because in the frequency domain, all the integrals, the derivatives, and everything else is simply replaced with the variable s, the Laplace variable. So now, if you have a system of differential equations in the variable s, that becomes like a system of uh, ordinary equations that you can simply solve using matrices instead of analytically plugging one equation into another. And so this will speed up the process and will allow us to find the transfer functions of more complex systems. Uh, okay, let me just turn on the tracking. That's not working. The camera is stuck over there. Never mind. Okay. So let's go through through it. So the idea today is to represent these differential equations as a set uh, as matrices that will basically give us the coefficients of those systems of equations, and then obtain the output of a given system using the Kramer's rule. And you'll see that will make things a lot easier than what we used to do. This example here, if I ask you to do the transfer function between the input and or whatever variable of interest, the voltage across the resistors, the capacitor or the current, you would have to write two equations, one for loop I1, one for I2, and then combine them and then find explicit relation or use some sort of um, uh, electrical circuit analysis. But instead of having these two set of equations, you can put these two equations into a matrix form and then solve for that using Kramer's rule. Now you'll notice here, there are two equations to describe the system because if every equation introduces a new variable. So if you have another branch that is going to give us another variable and another equation and so on. So every time we introduce a variable, we introduce a new equation. Otherwise the, the equations would be linearly dependent and redundant. So let's do, let's just start with an example here. Uh, you'll use this today for those who have the lab uh, section today. You use this example there. So here you have a parachute that is descending, we have a jumper and the parachute, and we want to model this system. So we could make a simple assumption here that both the parachute and the jumper have each a mass, and you can call that mass uh, P uh, for the parachute and mass J for the jumper. And now model all forces acting on these two masses. So what kind of forces are acting on this system? This is, of course, a model, a assumption, a idealization of the actual system. And you can assume that uh, the strings here that uh, hold the, the jumper and the parachute together could be modeled as a stiff, as a spring, a very large, with a very large uh, stiffness uh, coefficient. Of course, if the jumper goes back upwards, that doesn't work as a spring, but it, as long, so long as the jumper is going downwards, uh, we can see that that could behave as uh, a spring. So what kind of forces are acting here? to model the system. What is missing in there? So this is the basics. What can we add as external forces or acting to each of these masses? Gravity, very good. So gravity would act on both masses. What else? Friction, which is the air resistance in other words, right? So we could assume that on, for each of these masses, we have their, uh, mass times the uh, gravity, that's the 
force of gravity and we also have friction and this friction coefficient here is representing the effects of air resistance between the, the jumper and the parachute and you're assuming them to be uh, linearly dependent on the speed between the relative speed between the air and the, uh, the jumper. Okay, so let's do a more comprehensive model here. So we have all the same masses we had before. So for the jumper, this is the parachute MP and MJ would be the jumper. And let's give each of these a displacement. Let's call XP the jumper displacement, XJ uh, the parachute. And I'll list all the forces we have. So air resistance is acting upwards as the parachute goes downwards, air resistance go up. So you can assume that for both the jumper and the parachute, we have air resistance going upwards. And we're assuming that this resistance is, is proportional to the speed. And that proportionality constant is the coefficient of viscous friction between air and the jumper as an assumption, of course. And that is proportional to the speed. So if X is the position, then the speed of the mass of the jumper and the speed of the parachute is X dot, of course. And they both go upwards. And we have the effect of gravity for every one of them. So MJ times G and MJ MP times G. And now we have the spring force that is spring that we attached here. So for mass MP, in which way does the spring apply force to it, upwards or downwards? The spring is pulling the parachute down, isn't it? Because you have the jumper attached to the spring, so it is pulling, it's pushing it down. So we can have the spring force going down and the amount, the force acted, uh, uh, applied by that spring is simply the coefficient, the stiffness of the spring times the difference in position. Assuming that the jumper moves more than the parachute, we can say that that is xj minus xp, which would make sense in order to get a positive magnitude of force. You would want the uh, result of what is in the parentheses there to be positive. So if for the parachute, the force is, uh, for the, on, uh, from the spring is going down, then at the jumper side, it has to be going up. And that's precisely what the jumper feels. It feels a force moving upwards. Right? And you notice here, same magnitude, but opposite directions. Now that I have these two, we can simply find, uh, do the sum of forces and equate that to the mass times acceleration. So the part was to start with the parachute. We have uh, things are accelerate, uh, accelerating downwards. So we, let's assume that uh, going down is positive. So we have all forces BP X plus, uh, excuse me, that's going to be negative because it's going up plus the spring force and plus force of gravity. And this is going to be equal to mass times the acceleration, which in this case is the second derivative of position. We can now take the Laplace transform of this, assuming all initial conditions are zero. If you're looking for transfer functions, remember that always initial conditions are zero. That is negative BS X of P plus K X J minus X P plus M P. Now G here, we should assume G to be a step function, right? But for now, let's assume that a G, just to keep it more generic, is any function. So let's just call that a G of S. But we know that if we were to model this as gravity, it would indeed be a step function M G over S. But for now, let's assume that is simply a function. And this is equal to MP and the Laplace transform of the second derivative, we all know that now is the is S squared times function of interest. Now let's keep on this side of the equation, the, the inputs to the system, the external effects, that's MP times G of S. 
and move everybody else to the other side. So you have x p of s that will multiply m p s squared. What else goes there? All x p's we have plus b s plus k. And then for the x j we have k j positive goes to the other side negative. So minus k times x j of s. All good so far? Yeah. Okay. All right, now we can do the same for the jumper. And we have pretty much the same idea, minus bx j dot. Now the spring force is going upwards, so that's negative. And you have plus mj times g equals to mass times acceleration. That is mj xj double dot. Again, let's take the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform on the first derivative is simply s times that variable in the frequency domain minus k times xj minus xp. Of course, all functions of s plus mj. And again, let's assume that uh, this, this g, which is gravity, is for now a function. Uh, so simply a function g of s. And this is equal to mj s squared xj of s. Let's do the same now. We keep all the external inputs to the system on the left side of the equation. That is mj times g of s. And to the left, the right side, we'll write everything else. We have xj of s. You can factor everything here. mj s squared plus bs. What else? Plus k. And xp now is left. xp times k is positive on the left side. It goes to the right side, negative, minus k, xp of s. Let me just double check here if I didn't make any mistake. Yeah. So here we have now the two sets of equations, two equations that we need to find the output of the system. Now, if the output is this, the speed or position of the jumper, we would have to take the other equation, isolate for the variable, input that here, and then manipulate everything. So that's kind of annoying. There's a lot of steps there. There's a lot of room for mistake. So there's, there's got to be a better way. And there is indeed. Are we good here? Any questions? No? OK. So here are the two equations. Now the equations that we got in the frequency domain are also there. And the question is, how do we find a transfer function now between gravity and the displacement of each of them? So we'll do that in a bit. But instead of doing this the traditional way that we did in the last lecture, substituting one equation into another, let's introduce a better way to do that. And that's where Cromer's rule comes in handy. So this is simply a way to solve a system of equations. Right? And here, our system of differential equations are now simply a system of ordinary equations because it's simply a function of s. It's no longer a function of first derivative, second derivative, integration, and so on. Right? So here, th that's all we need to know. It's all here on this slide. It may look a bit intimidating, but we'll see that's not complicated at all. So if you have n linear equations, differential equations in our case, in our case for the parachute jumper, we had two. We now want to write these equations in this format, a times x equals to b. A here will be a square matrix of size n. And we will hold all the coefficients that are multiplied the variables of interest, that is m, b, k, and all those coefficients uh, that are fixed, that have fixed values. X would be the variables of interest. So if th this will be a vector of one by N. And in this vector, we will input all the variables of interest. In our case, the variables of interest are both positions, so MJ 
uh, excuse me, X uh, P and X J. And the B on the other side will be the external input to the system, whatever is applied to the system that is not a, not, not a variable, not a, um, um, a variable or a uh, coefficient is whatever is external to the system and is applied to make it move. In this case would be the gravity. And that's why I left gravity in generic terms as a function of S rather than putting the Laplace of one over uh, one over S as the step function. And once we have established the equation, once you write the equation in this format, we can now solve for the variable of interest. So Xi would be element I in X. So X1 in our case would be the part, the, let's say XP um, or XJ, depending on how we organize the equation. And now to find that, we simply need to calculate the determinant of both matrices. Determinant of A is easy. The determinant of AI will be, the matrix AI will be formed by replacing the ith column with B. A is formed by replacing the ith column of A with B. I know that this doesn't make much sense now, but it will when we, uh, do an example. So what I'm saying here is you take matrix A, if you want to find for the first element in X, then take a vector B and input that in the first column of A. If you want to find the second element, then vector B replaces the second column in matrix A and so on. This slide summarizes everything we need to know, but let's do an example to make this more, more clear. Let's assume here that this is the system of differential equations that we got. We have three equations, three variables. And now we can arrange this in the format we want. Ax plus b equals to b. Uh, Ax, sorry, a times x equals to b. A in this case will be a three by three matrix. X is the variable that we want to solve for and b is the output of the system. So we're starting with X, if X are the variables, X, uh, Y, and Z here would be the variables. We can organize them that way, which will tell us how to create matrix A. And you see here that if you want to go back to the equations we had on top, now we need to multiply A by uh, X by A, B by Y, C by Z, and so on. All right, so that tells us how to organize matrix a, which is this big matrix here. And this will, of course, equate to B. Equate to B. All right, so these matrix, these matrices here are simply the representation of differential equations in a matrix form. Nothing, nothing really new here. It's just another representation. And now, if you want to find what you're looking for is a solution for X, Y, and Z. Those are the variables of interest. So I told you earlier that we find the, uh, the um, X, I element by calculating the determinant of A, I divided by the determinant of A. And A, I is made by replacing the column, the respective column with vector B. Let's see what that means in, at the bottom here. So matrix A is there if you're now looking for the first element in vector B, which is X, then you'll take the first column of A and replace that with B. So AI will become JKL times B, C, E, F, I. So these ones are the same, they're a constant, they didn't change. And this folks here were input in the first column. So the top uh, matrix here is AI. And right, the bottom is the matrix A. Is that clear? Yeah. Now, if you want to find Y, Y is the second element in B. So now you're going to replace the second element in the matrix I with B. And you see that the, the middle column there, the middle uh, matrix. And same goes for Z. Z is the last element in X, meaning that we'll replace the last column of matrix A to form A 
3 for ai for when i equals to 3 and that then gives the result for z and there is a typo here this should be z instead of y and that's 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 it now what do we have to do is to find the determinants of both matrices here and that's the solution for the variables of interest are there any questions we are will now apply this to the the example we just modeled are there any questions no all good yeah the folks that are at home can also ask questions everybody here in the hall will hear you okay so now let's apply this to the example we just modeled so these are the two equations we came up with two equations two variables now matrix a will be two by two vector x will be one by two and so is the uh, vector b so let's establish our equations here by arbitrarily saying that we want this to be xp and xj we could do it the other way that works of course xp of s xj of s i'm just omitting s for uh, laziness uh, all right so what should go now in our matrix a we have a two by two matrix and the first element should be whatever multiplies xp in the first equation here so that is mps plus bps plus k the second element needs to be whatever multiplies xj that is negative k and you can now repeat the process but at this time we we'll use the other equation starting with xp the coefficient of xp is negative k and the coefficient of xj is mjs squared plus bjs plus k and this equals to whatever is the input to those matrices there so that is uh, equations excuse me mp g uh, g of s and m j g of s right. one of those elements could be zero they don't all need to have something if there is no external forces applied to the equation if the equations on top were equating to zero then of course uh, the last vector there would have zero elements are we good with the formulation of these matrices yeah Sorry, could you say that? Uh, did they? Yes, yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, any? Yes, so the this element in the matrix here is whatever element multiplies when you do the multiplication of matrices the first equation will be this times that plus this times this equals to that all right and for the other matrix we have this times that plus this times that equals to that all right so to make the equations work when you do the multiplication we want to go back to the original equations now we can formulate the determinants to find the outputs the outputs here are xp and xj xp being the first element in vector b we now need to replace the first column of a with the input vector so the first column of a is mp g of s mj g of s and that replaces now the first column in the matrix and the second column remains the same and the denominator there remember that is simply a so that doesn't change that one remains the same and now you guessed if you want to find xj xj is the second element in vector b we are now going to replace the second element to form matrix i uh, a2 so the denominator here 
does not change. It is exactly the same. But the numerator now will change because you're now replacing the second column. The first column remains the same. And now the second column is replaced with the input vector. Okay, and now we find the determinant of these two matrices that will give us the transfer function. Now notice something interesting. And when we do the determinant on top of either matrix, we'll be doing these two terms multiplied minus the multiplication of the, those two terms. And all terms in the numerator of the resulting equation will have G of S in them. All terms in the numerator will have G of S in them, which means that you can mo move G of S to the other side of the equation. And then you have XP over G and that's precisely the transfer function. And same goes for the other one. We noted, notice that when you do the determinant, all terms in the numerator will have G of S. We can factor out G of S, move that to the left side of the equation. And that gives xj over g. And that's precisely the transfer function we were looking for. All right? That should always happen. If it doesn't, there's a mistake somewhere. All good? Yeah, so if you have an, uh, let's put a, uh, the determinant here of A, B, C, D. This is A, D minus B, C. If you have three, then I have to expand that to, uh, let's, put, let's create another one here. A, B, C, D, E, F. We can, there are many ways to do this, but the way I do it, so just expand the matrix like that. And then we do, uh, sorry, I forgot. This is not a three by three. Let me start over. Let's see, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, something like that. I can multiply, I can expand the first two here. And then would do this plus, uh, sorry, this times that times that, Ever add everything up. So all three terms added together minus then the opposite, this minus that minus that one. I mean, there are other ways to do this. You can do use whatever method you want. If you want to use a, uh, whatever tool online, if you find online, go for it. I'm not here to uh, test your ability to do calculus, but how to apply that to um, problems. So it, same goes for the integrations in th those long integrations that we had in the assignment. If you want to use an online software to do that, just go for it. And when you solve this system, these two determinants, these are the equations we get. All right. And you notice again that we are able to factor out the G of S, move that to the left side of the equation. Now you have a beautiful transfer function uh, between the input and output here. And we always want to prepare the final transfer function as shown here. We see what you have S to the power of four with all coefficients. Uh, factored out s to the power of three with everything that multiplies s to the power of three together. We we'll basically want two uh, polynomials of s with everything being factored there for simplicity. Okay, that's all. That's all we need to solve these. This function, this uh, system of differential equations with Cromer's rule. We are not going to go higher than uh, four, than three by three. Are we good? Any questions? No. If there are no questions, then let's do a few examples and just apply this and see what time it is. Okay, so we have about 
50, 40, 40 minutes, we can do three examples. Shall we? Yeah. Any questions? It's not hard. You'll see it's always the same. When you start doing examples, it's the same thing over and over. Let's do this one. Have you seen this one before? If you say no, we have a problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's from the last one exercise we did in the last class. We did this the hard way. We were interested in the transfer function between the input force R of T and the speed of mass M1 V of T. Now let's take this one step further and find the transfer function between the input force R of T and the speed of each of those masses. Because we are dealing with speed, you remember from last lecture, we modeled this. I created the free body diagram and you, we did all the equations as a function of V, V1 and V2. Well, we don't need to do that again. That was done before. Here are the equations we derived in the last lecture. We can just use them. If you have any questions on how we came up with these equations, please go back to the video and they will be there. So that's, this is going to be the starting point for this exercise. And we want to do the transfer function between R and V1 and R and V2. Do we have enough space here to do both? Yeah. So first things first, Let's create now the system. Let's describe this system of equation using the notation we just established. Ax equals to b. What is x in this case? What is vector x? What goes in vector? What elements go in vector x? V1 and V2. Very good. What goes in a? Everything that multiplies V1 and V2. Uh, and what goes in B, that's R of S and zero. So we can start with X saying that X is V1, V2. So I multiplies V1, let's start with the first equation here. I did V1, V2, but we could certainly do V2, V1. That should, doesn't change anything. All right. Starting with the first equation, what multiplies V1? That is M1S plus B1 plus B2. And what multiplies V2? That's negative B1. And this is equal to everything that is external to the equation, in this case, R of S. Now notice that when you multiply this times that and this times that, we get R of S and we go back to the original equation we started from. Now tell me what to do in the second line there. Now we are dealing with the second equation. What goes in matrix A? Negative B1, yep. Correct. So we have very good negative B1, and you have M2S plus B1 plus K over S. And then on the other side, there's nothing being externally applied to the system, the equation. So that is zero. There are no, there's no force in term in the equation, that's zero. Now notice once again that when you multiply this out, they will multiply B1 with V. Let's start with V2 and we get zero, which is precisely what we started from. Okay. So that's the first step. Now let's find the equation for V1. If you want to find the equation for V1, we need to create those uh, that matrix AI. And the matrix AI in this case, because we are dealing with the first element in uh, vector X, is created by replacing the first column of A with B. So B is R of S and zero. And the second column here remains the same, minus B1. 2s plus b1 plus k over s. I replace the first column 
with the vector, the input vector. And this is divided by the determinant of matrix A, which is that. So our job is 90% done. Now we need to calculate those determinants. And to find the determinant of the top one, we'll do R times that minus minus B1 times that. So that is V1 of S equals to R times M2S plus B1 plus K over S minus uh, minus b1 times zero and divided by m1s plus b1 plus b2 times m2s plus b1 plus k over s minus minus b1 times minus b2 which is b1 squared Right, minus B1 times minus minus B1 times minus B2. So that's minus B1 squared. Yeah. Now we can notice again that on top of the equation here, this is zero. We are left with R of S on top of the equation, which can be moved out, uh, moved to, uh, to the left side. And this is now the transfer function, which is precisely what you have there. Right. Now, this is not really a transfer function yet because we don't have a, a very nice polynomial of s to the power of two and s one and so on, but we'll skip that because this simple annoying math, right? But the idea is that now we would multiply everybody out here and factor out coefficients of s squared, s and coefficients of s to the power of two. And that would be the final transfer function. But you recognize this format from the last lecture. This is precisely what we got when we did this the other way. Okay. Any questions here? No? good yeah now let's do v2 then let's we did v1 let's do v2 so i'm going to copy this and now let's solve for v2 of s well the denominator is the determinant of a so that doesn't change i'm going to copy from here Right, but the numerator now changes because you're now dealing with the second element of matrix uh, of vector X. So that means that a matrix A on top or AI now becomes, it is formed by replacing the second column with the input vector, which in this case is, oops, R of S zero. Now notice here what we did before, we had RS on the first one, now R, uh, RS zero is on in the second column simply. And with this being done, we can calculate V2 of S. The denominator is the same. I'm gonna copy from the other side here. Denominator is exactly the same. And the numerator is, what is that? M1, S, B, B1, B2, that's zero. R of S times B1, because you're going back, that's positive. So that's R S plus R S times B1. Right, and that's now the transfer function between the other mass, uh, the speed of the other mass, uh, V M2, and the input force. Once again, notice that R of S, the input to the system 
is always, you can always factor that out in the numerator. And this is again the case because that allows us to move R of S to the left side of the equation and have V2 over R, which is again, the transfer function we were looking for. Right? You can just multiply the denominator out. That will give us the final answer for the transfer function. Yeah? Any questions? No? All good? No questions at home? Anybody? Okay. I see no questions. Let's do another one then. Yeah? Let's do this circuit. Now, with this, this is a simple circuit. We want to use Kramer's rule to determine the transfer function between the current in each branch and the input uh, voltage, blood pressure. This was probably from a different exercise. Input voltage. What is the final value of the currents for a unit step voltage? Okay. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's pretty simple. Because you, you could in the, here do like a parallel impedance with another and so on to find the solution. But let's do uh, this using Kramer's rule by creating now two equations and then uh, combining them with the matrices we just derived. So let's start with the first loop here. First loop, let's call this current I1. Let's call that current I2. Now let's do the equations here and let's just start straight in the frequency domain. We can skip the time domain now. We don't need that anymore. Yeah, let's go to the frequency domain directly. So V of S becomes, V of T becomes V of S. And this is equal to the voltage drop across all elements in that loop. So the first one is the resistor and that is R times the current. The second one is the inductor, L times the derivative of the current in the frequency domain that is S I one of S, yeah? And plus the voltage across the capacitor, which is the integral of the net current through the capacitor, one over C, integral is one over S, so one over CS. And the net current through it is I one, minus I2. We can now factor out I1. That is that. And the elements with I2 are simply one over CS. Does that make sense? Yeah, perhaps, maybe. So if that makes sense, then tell me what the second loop looks like. It's starting at the resistor here. What do we have? Voltage across that resistor is I, R2, I2R, yeah? plus the voltage across the inductor is L2 of S, exactly, plus the voltage across the capacitor on the left, one over CS I2 of S. And now when you come back up, what is the voltage drop there? One over CS, integral of the car, the current times one over C. Right, okay, so I1 or minus S or I2, I2 minus I1, right? I2 minus I1, because now our reference current is, is I2, right? So I2 is positive, whatever comes against it is negative. And this is equal to zero. 
Very good. Now we can factor out I2 of S. And what do we get? Uh, sorry, yeah, I2 of S, so we get R plus LS plus two over CS. There is one here, there's one there. And you can factor out I1 minus I1 of S, and there is only one I1, right? Times one over CS equals to zero. Now I have two equations. These equations are sufficient to describe the output of the system or to describe the variables we are looking for. And we can now establish the matrix. And let's establish our matrix beginning with vector X. What goes in vector X? So we have A times X equals to B. What goes in vector X? Vector X holds the variables we are solving for. In this case, I1S and I2S, very good. If we had another variable of interest, say for example, the voltage across one of the capacitors, that would give us a third equation and that voltage would make it to the third line of vector X. And uh, now that we establish I1, I2 or I2, I1, that it wouldn't have changed anything. We can look at the first and second equation and fill out the matrix. So what multiplies I1 in the first equation? If exactly, R plus LS plus one over CS. And one multiplies I2, that is negative one over CS. We can now look at the second equation. Well, before we do that, we need to look at any external inputs to the first equation. And the external inputs to that is V of S. All right, so multiply everything out, we go back to the equation we started from. And the second equation, now you multiply I1 is negative one over CS. And what multiplies I2 is R plus LS plus two over CS. And this is equal to external forces or the external uh, factors or forcing terms, which in this case is zero. Let me check my calculations here, make sure I didn't make any mistake. Yep, that looks good. Any questions? No? Okay. If there are no questions, we can move on. I'm gonna copy the, oh, that's already, already there, look at that. That's the equation we came up with the matrix, and now let's find I2 and I1. Let's just start with I1. I1 can be found by now constructing matrix I, uh, A1, which is constructed by replacing the first column of A with the input vector. And the second one remains the same. And this is divided by the determinant of matrix A. Right, we just replaced the first column in the top there, the first column of matrix A with the input vector, the S0. And now that we have that, we can find the transfer function by just doing the determinant. So the determinant of the top is simply V of S times, don't forget the parentheses here, 
minus zero, all right? So we can omit that, divided by the determinant of the denominator. minus one over c squared s squared. All right, negative one over cs times negative one over cs is plus one over cs is c, cs squared s squared c squared s squared, but then the determinant has another negative sign. So that's negative. This is not quite the transfer function yet because we need, we have a, a, ra a, poly, a ratio, we have a fraction of S in the numerator and the denominator, we don't want that. So we would have to further manipulate this equation using simple math steps to get a nice polynomial on the numerator and denominator. I'm gonna skip that because it's just, it's just simple math. Okay. But now we can see that at the top of the equation, once again, has the input vector, input variable here that it can be taken to the left side of the equation given given I1 over V as the transfer function we were looking for. We can now do one more, but we can now solve for I2. And for I2 of S, the denominator doesn't change, it's still the same one, but the numerator here will now be slightly different. What is the numerator? The numerator now will be created by taking matrix A. Here is matrix A. And we replace now the second column of matrix A with the input vector B. So the first column remains the same. And the second one is replaced with, you know, the determinant becomes Vs times one over Cs, L plus uh, R Ls one over Cs times zero is zero, Vs times negative one over CS is negative, but the determinant has a negative sign that makes it all positive. And this is divided by the same determinant, the same result we had before. Let me copy from that. There it is. Okay, and again, look at the top of the equation there. We have V of S that can be factored out and moved to the other side of the equation, giving out the transfer function I2 over V. Now you can see that this is a lot easier than making two, two equations, replacing one into another, especially when you have more than two equations. If you had, if you extended this circuit with a third branch, then you would have three equations and manipulating them would be a nightmare but this makes things a lot easier. Easy, isn't it? It's very easy. Once you get this set of equations, then uh, the process is very straightforward. Any questions? No? And also remember that when we are dealing with transfer functions, we are always assuming zero initial conditions. Right? That was not the case. Then you would have terms on top of the equation here that would not be multiplied by Vs. And in that, uh, that way we wouldn't be able to find I2 over Vs explicitly because these initial condition terms would show up on top there. Good. Yeah, all right, let's do 
another one then. Let's just skip this one. If you have time, we come back here. Let's do this one. The mechanical system. So using Kramer's rule, find the transfer function between the displacement of each mass and the input force. And then let's um, add a little complication here. Let's find the final value of displacement for a unit step input. But first, let's find the equations of motion and then find the transfer function. So here we have two masses. We can give the displacement of mass M2, let's call that X2. Displacement of mass M1, let's call that X1. If you want to find the equations that govern this system, we first need to do the free body diagram, then sum all forces and find the governing equation. So this is X1, this is X2. Let's start with the free body diagram for mass M2. What forces are acting on mass M2? Well, we have the external force F of T, which in the frequency domain becomes F of S. What else is acting on mass M2? You have a damper that connects both masses and you have a spring. Now mass M2 is moving to the right, which means that the damper and the spring are opposing displacement, the displacement of that mass and therefore are applying a force to the left. You're applying a force to the left. So this is the damper and this is the spring. What is the magnitude of the force being applied by the damper? What is it? Exactly. So B times S times X2 minus X1. Now let's analyze that. What is the S doing there? It's taking the derivative of the displacement. That's the speed. And you're writing X2 dot, dot basically minus X1 dot under the assumption that a mass M2 moves a bit faster than mass M1 in the beginning, so that the result of what is in parentheses there is positive, which just means that the direction of force is correct. All right, so X1, this is basically B times X1 dot minus X, X2 dot minus X1 dot. In the frequency domain, the dot, the derivative becomes S. And X2 and X1 are of course functions of S that I omitted here. What is the magnitude of the spring force now? What is the magnitude? Yep. Exactly. K times X2 minus X1. Same story. Assuming that X2 is greater than X1, which is not correct, but in the beginning of motion, it might be. Multiply that by k gives the force. So the first one is a function, the, the, the damper is a function of speed. The second one is a function of position. Meaning that when the system settles, when it stops moving, what is the force applied by the damper? Zero, All right? It has to be zero because, because once it stops, X2 dot and X1 dot are both zero. So the damper does nothing. If you apply a force to mass M1 and hold it, eventually the only thing applying forces to each masses will be the spring because those are functions of displacement and not speed. Now let's go to mass M1. If the spring K2 and the damper are applying a force on mass M2 to the left, then they are applying a force to mass M1 to the right. And they have, these forces have precisely the same magnitude. But opposite directions as compared to M2. And we have this other spring here, K1, that applies a force to the right, to the left. 
uh, as mass M1 moves to the right, what is the magnitude of that force? Is K1 times X1, right? Simply K1 times X1. The other end of the spring is fixed. It has no displacement, it's zero, right? So simply X1. So now that we have these, we can do the balance of forces. Let's just start with mass M2. Because things here, are, they seem to be moving to the right. Let's assume that everything that points to the right is positive. We have F of S minus BS X2 minus X1 minus K times X2 minus X1. And this is equal to M2 times its acceleration, which is the second derivative of position. Yeah. M2 times S squared of X2. S squared is the second derivative of position, which is the acceleration of the mass. Now that we have the equation, let's think about the way we need these equations to make these matrices. We need F of S on one side and everybody else on the other side. So let's keep F of S here. And F of S is, let's factor out X2 of S. What do we have? M2 S squared plus BS plus K. And let's factor out X1. What do you have for X1? We have X1 times BS positive going goes to the other side negative. So negative X1 times BS. And then there's also another X1 here plus K. Yep. Uh, BS, uh, no, uh, so X2, let's look at it. So X2, from, from this multiplication, we have a negative number. And when you go to the right side of the equation, it becomes positive. Yes, I shifted everything to the right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are we good? All right, so now let's do mass M1. For mass M1, we have BS X2 minus X1 plus K X2 minus X1 minus K1 X1 of S. And this is equal to M1 s squared x1 All right second derivative of x1 acceleration times the mass m1 and once again we now need to prepare the equation in the format we need for the subsequent steps and that means having all the external factors on one side which in this case is zero there are no external forces and everybody else needs to be now moved to the right side so you have uh, starting, we're starting with X1. What do you have? We have M1 S squared plus BS plus K1. This first, what is this K here? Is this, this is K2, right? Yeah, that's K2 plus K2 plus K1. I'm moving everybody to the left side. And then you have minus X2 of S, BS plus K2 equals to zero. I don't get lost with the sign changes there. I moved everybody to the right side. Is this the right side? Yeah, the right side of the equation. I and factored out X1 and X2. Let me just check here before we 
continue. So make sure I didn't have didn't make any mistakes. Okay, that looks good. Yep. And with these equations, we can now find the the matrix we need for Kramer's rule. What would that be? Well, let's start by defining the variables of interest, which in this case are uh, clearly x1 and x2. So we can have x1 of s and x2 of s, which will tell us how to organize a matrix A here. And this is going to be equal to the input vector. Now let's start with the equation for mass M2. We could do it the other way, it doesn't matter. Let's start with the mass M, with mass M2. What goes in the first line of matrix A? Whatever multiplies X1 first, and whatever multiplies X2 second. So what multiplies X1 is negative BS plus K. I'm taking it from this equation here. And whatever multiplies X2 is M2S squared plus BS plus K. Which K is that one? That's K2, right? Yeah. Is that K2? Yeah, that's K2. And this is also K2. This is K2. Okay, and this is equal to, equal to F of S, F of S. Now let's move on to the second equation. In the second equation, which is here, whatever multiplies X1, goes first, because that's the way we define the vector, but we could have done this the other way around, in which case these two lines would be flipped, and whatever multiplies x2, and this is equal to zero. Yeah? Okay, are we good? Very well. So here's the equation, the matrix we just came up with. Now let's find X1 and X2. Now what is X1? X1 is the determinant of matrix A1, which is found by replacing the input vector in the first column and keeping the second column here the same. And the determinant at the bottom is simply the original matrix. The S. What is the result here? Is f of s times negative ps plus k2 divided by the determinant of the bottom here. We have th those, those two terms are equal. We multiply them, we get ps plus k2 squared and then negative the multiplication of the other two M2S squared plus BS plus K2 times M1S squared plus BS plus K1 plus K2. 
And that's pretty much our transfer function because now f of s can be moved to the other side of the equation. And now we'd have to multiply everybody out here and then factor coefficients of s. This would be a fourth order equation and then move on from there. Now, what is the final value of the displacement of mass M1 if we apply one Newton to, to the mass and hold it steady? Let's do that. What, you can, what can we do here? We have two options. We can look at this equation, take the inverse Laplace transform and make time tend to infinity, or we can be smarter and take the final value theorem of this in the Laplace domain, and that would also give us the same result. So let's assume that we are applying a force to this mass, to mass M2 as, uh, as we have here. And this mass will be, this force, excuse me, will be a force of one Newton. And this force will be held constant as time goes to infinity. And you want to know where does mass M1 stop? So basically applying a force and holding it. What kind of step, uh, what kind of input do we have here? The impulse, a step, a ramp, a step input. So F of S is simply one over S. If the magnitude was five Newtons, it would be five over S. And we can now find the final displacement of the mass by simply calculating, let's call this X1 infinity, the limit when S tends to zero of S times x1 of s s times x1 of s what is x1 well x1 is the entire equation we had there we are now replacing f of s with one over s so x1 infinity is the limit when S tends to zero of S times this whole thing, but our F of S here is one over S. This is F of S. And what is the result? Well, this S and this S will cancel. And then we can find the limit by simply making now S tend to zero and what we are left with. On the numerator, when S is zero, we are left with negative K2. And the denominator, we have K2 squared minus K2 times K1 plus K2 which is the same if we divide everybody here by K2, K2 is negative one over K2 minus K1 minus K2, which is one over K1. I did the last step here, just divided the top and the bottom by K1, by K2, excuse me, which eliminates the square and eliminates K1 from the top. And the result is one over K1. Does that make any sense? If you're applying a force of one Newton, the final displacement is one over the stiffness of spring K1. That makes perfect sense. Because the, once the system settles, there is one Newton going through the springs and one Newton is also applied to mass M1, right? The displacement or the force in the spring is K1 times X. That's the force. So if you solve for the displacement is the force divided by K1. That's precisely what we got here. If you had applied five Newton meters, Newtons to it, it would be five over K1. Okay. Yeah. We can now do X2 maybe. Let's do X2. What is X2? 
X2 is, the matrix now is formed by replacing the second column with F of S and zero. And the denominator here becomes the same as we had before. I'm gonna copy it here. And this is negative F of S times M1 S squared plus B S plus K1 plus K2 divided by whatever we got before that this did not change. Yeah, that does not change. Yep. And now we can find, if you want to find the final value, what do we do? X to infinity is the limit when S tends to zero of S times X one. F of S is one over S. And you can find here, oops, just move this there quickly. There it is. And you can now find there's a negative sign here. Don't forget it, it comes from that sign. And you can also for the final value. 